Good morning, everyone. Yes, another morning. There is Friday morning. What am I saying? It's Friday. Now you can read between the lines. Let's get into it because these readings are long. So um, we're looking at arrogance. I red flag of arrogance. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, God, for your grace and mercy in our lives. God, um, we want to place our lives before you. God, sometimes we don't have a clue what you're doing with our lives. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. But keep us humble, Lord, and take us away, away in a spirit of arrogance from our lives, because that's not a few, and it just detox us and those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you're doing well on your journey so far. And as I said, we're looking at arrogance this morning. So what are the symptoms of arrogance? Lack of humility, lack of trust, immaturity, superiority complex, sees others as incompetent, not a team player, hoards information to secure position. Do we have a lot of those people around? And antidote, learn the importance of teamwork, trust, cultivate genuine interest in others, self-development and open-mindedness towards your own awareness of who you are and others, understanding, being humble and meek. Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I can do things you cannot do. You can do things I cannot do. Together we can do something beautiful with God and for God. The difference between arrogance and confidence, we all know someone who thinks they know it all, no matter what the subject, whether it's politics or tennis or how to cook spaghetti. Someone who's always quick to rubbish others. Does anybody like to work with these people? I don't think so, I don't. Does anybody like to talk to these people? Mm -mm. Does anybody like to spend time with these people? Not really. They don't stop to listen to you, they just, rubbish you and shut you down. Yeah, I certainly don't. And to me, there is no better definition of toxicity than arrogance. The toxic red flag of arrogance is a relationship killer and a workplace disruptor. Do we have a lot of those people? I've never met so many people like those in my life. Mm -hmm. It's kind of disheartening that there's so many arrogant, entitled people in the world. So many people would think, disabuse the system and think and do it arrogantly. It is based on contempt and stokes resentment and animosity rather than love, respect and teamwork. The arrogant person boasts, my ability is so much greater than yours. I don't trust you to do it, whatever it is. And if you try, I reserve the right to correct you. And I don't trust the team. I don't trust my friends. I don't trust anybody. I don't trust the church. I don't trust my family. I don't trust the institution. Only I can do it or it will not be done right. Sometimes arrogance is passed off as supreme confidence. Only I can do it because, well, I am the best. But arrogance is not true confidence. It comes from a place of insecurity of lack. If you are truly confident in your own abilities and expertise, you don't need to be arrogant or to tell people how you are and how good you are. Am I not good? Pat myself at the shoulder because I'm so good. It's not self-talk, it's arrogance most of the time. It's good to pat yourself on the shoulder because most of us don't know how to take compliments and that's another problem. But arrogance is different from confidence. They already know this is a difference between arrogance. There is a different, this is a difference between arrogance and confidence. Arrogance can't help but toot its own on all the time. And to be at the head of its own parade, they must be the star of the show all the time. Whereas confidence just gets the job done with excellence and little fanfare. Why we should learn to listen to understand and understand and not just to respond. The arrogant argue to win, not to understand. They do not know how to see another person's point of view or even care to try. Sure, we don't always agree with one another, but to get along in the world, to be successful and to learn and grow, we must be willing to engage with others who have different opinions, different ideas and ways of looking at the world. We cannot always box ourselves into one way of thinking or, or you don't understand, it's my way or no way that I way. There will always be someone who fails to see our point of view, no matter how compelling or logically sound the argument. And that's okay. We should still seek to understand them anyway, even if we disagree with them. This is where active listening comes in handy. Yeah, I do a lot of that. Listen to a lot of people that I don't agree with. We should learn it ourselves for our personal and work relationships. 
If we're leaders, we should teach it to our teams. Active listening entails acknowledging what you've heard from the other party by repeating it. Once the other person or individual confirms you heard them correctly, he or she will be more open to truly hearing your side of the argument. So many people, you can de-escalate a big situation by just listening intently. And let that person know that you're listening. Some people are listening to you and they're doing a million tasks. You're not really listening, you're hearing. You will be more equipped to correctly analyze their position and clarify the points of argument, agreements and contentions. Oftentimes you will recognize that there's not much disagreement anyway, and the person just wants to be heard. Oftentimes in the world, we try to just brush away people's problems instead of just listening and rubbishing it. Oh, it's not important, it's not significant. Yes, it is, because it's to the person, whether you think it's significant or not. Analyzing an argument keeps our minds flexible and sharp. This is not something you can do effectively if you haven't learned to listen to other individual point of view and understand where they're coming from. I get paid to listen to people, yeah. Active listening does not require buy-in or agreement. You don't have to agree with the person. I don't. That's their point of view and they're entitled to it. So often we reject a point of view without even taking the time to consider it because it's not always Analyzing someone else's argument doesn't require us to suspend our healthy skepticism or law of philosophical standards. No, it doesn't. This is called agreeing to disagree. I do that a lot, even without saying it. Agreeing to disagree requires critical thinking, maturity, and trust. Traits the arrogant and superior don't have in abundance at all. Out of distrust, the arrogant and superiors assume the other party will weaponize the argument, so they preemptively weaponize it first. Yeah, that's what they do. Unfortunately, weaponizing disagreement is an apt description of the state of discourse these days, and that's all in overall world everywhere. Name calling has become the norm from the contrived shouting matches on sports center to the out of control exchanges on the media. It has become acceptable, fashionable, even for discussion to develop into name calling. Why waste time listening and trying to understand another point of view when you can win an argument and garner higher ratings by simply yelling more loudly. They're not debating skills, but the antics of a bully, that's what they are. We have thrown critical thinking to the wayside, and I think for once we should bring it back because it's too late. It isn't too late. The importance of critical thinking skills, we need it. Nobody think anymore, everybody just gush into. Nobody wanna think. Oh, the government says this, so I do it. This person said this, so I do it. Think for yourself. It's an art that's lost. We rely on media to tell us everything. Oh, I can Google it. Oh, I can ask Siri. Oh, or someone from Amazon call, can't remember the name. We can just ask. We don't think for ourselves anymore. We must attempt to understand each other by engaging in adult discussion. By using our critical thinking skills, this will stimulate true development and growth. How does this encourage growth? The God we serve encourage growth. He listens to us. He says, come let us reason together. We grow when legitimate conflict and disagreements force us to see another way of doing things, another way of thinking. Healthy, respectful conflict is discussion forces us to expand our knowledge and creativity. It will let us grow. Take a moment to reflect on your own recent debates and disagreements. To what extent did you engage without the intention of truly understanding the other person's point of view? The arrogance displayed in this kind of arguing merely to win is particularly harmful in personal relationships, including romantic partners and friends and family members. I can't think of how many families do this aimlessly. There's not just one way to install toilet paper, do the dishes, save and spend money, figure out a career, you name it. There are several ways to do things. There's not one way to evangelize or to share Jesus or to be kind to others. Once one adult starts dictating to another adult how to do anything, unless asked, of course, that's a red flag and in and of itself. Working together to complete a goal of or compromising on a division of labor in a household or example that demonstrates the ability to circumvent this red flag called arrogance. If someone is better at organizing the home, take their lead. If another has shown experience or has experience in finances, let that individual play the lead role in that area. We can all play a role based on our experience and abilities. One thing I learned from my maternal grandparents, I didn't understand certain logics in your relationship, but within a couple of days, I understand the dynamics. The person who had the strength, whether they did it, it was not hurt the nicest of ways all the time. That person took charge of the finances because they recognized that they wouldn't have had much if the other person take charge because the person, other person was extremely too kind and was taken for granted by everybody else. 
So use your skills, that's all I'm saying. Tried and true versus new and innovative, which side is better? In the workplace, arrogance and security can be a big disruptor as well. When a tenured employee or experienced business partner has achieved success, they can grow arrogant. They may question the contempt, comp competency and abilities of others without grounds. They may question the leader of the team. This could be harmless and even fruitful if done with respect and good faith. However, if the tenured employee continues to devalue the less tenured, even in the face of proof of their value, then this potentially toxic issue must be addressed. You can spot this element in this old guard, the trusted employee who has who have been on the team from the beginning. The old guard may perceive that the new individuals are too green to play an integral role. Tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Even though they have already been vetted. I find myself in a situation a lot as a newbie on the team, yet you get to do most of the work. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to remunerating, mm -mm. as important tasks are assigned to newer, less tenured team members, the veterans experience a crisis of trust and confidence. Oh yeah, they feel threatened, mm -hmm. very threatened. They view themselves as a nucleus of the team and the newbies as green orange who don't have value. Mm -hmm. Often what the tenured fear is if they acknowledge the newbies skills, and if they have anything to offer, then they become obsolete. Tell me about that, I'm seeing it right now. It is important to give more experienced workers or long-term friends an opportunity to express their misgivings so that you can address them. Otherwise, the newer members may simply get tired and leave. Tell me about it. <laughs> Due to the constant barrage of negativity and resistance, what I always get. When the tried and true are threatened by the new, this of course may be the goal of the more tenured team members. Oh yeah, they do it a lot. If you are the leader, the more tenured workers, if they're committed to being disruptive, may be the ones who need to go. Mm -hmm. And they never go anywhere. And they abuse the system profusely. And the ones who stay must be reintegrated into the team, almost as if you are from the team from scratch. I think it's a sin to work for the government because no one abuses the system like government workers. I never get it at understanding. The challenge is to win them over again, to figure out a way to get them on board, a sense of entitlement and arrogance over again, to figure out a way to get them on board with a challenge without alienating them. As a new blood comes in, all bloods need to buy into the rationale for the change. And the same applies to the church. Take the same concept because I don't wanna to take too long. I've already taken long. If the issue isn't addressed, the old guard may sabotage the team. One symptom of the toxic red flag is hoarding information, and that happens a lot in the workplace. One person who has been there for years and have all the skills, yet you're retiring. And if you're not at work, no one at our church, no one else can take over. Arrogance. Hoarding happens for several reasons. The old God perceived new members, ideas, or ways of doing things as a threat to their position and importance. If I hear this one more time, this is the way we always do it, I'm going to puke. I'm tired of hearing that. That's stagnancy, arrogance and scare, self-preservation. How often have you observed and experienced individual train a new person but leave out certain areas of knowledge so they will always have an edge? I guess I'm silly and stupid because I always give them my best because I want them to excel more than me. That is called teaching and mentoring someone. Your mentee is supposed to be better than you. I have seen it often. It's like the cliche of the mother-in-law who leaves out the most important ingredients when she gives her daughter-in-law her son's favorite meatloaf recipe. Mm -hmm. This is what happens with a scarcity mindset. The perception is that there is not enough room for everyone. So I better make sure I secure room for myself. So I become ruthless, dog eat dog type of a mentality. Every person for him or herself in the church, in the workplace, in the family, in all communities, I win, you lose. Why can't we all win? The team members or business associates who are out of to win like this do so at the expense of the team. It's happened so often in the church, unfortunately, and in families, the inability to listen and see another point of view undermines the team's development. There will be a weak link on the team until you teach them the skills of active listening. Those who haven't learned to listen haven't learned to trust and grow. This skill is necessary to negotiate. It's one of the first steps required to build a team of people with diverse points of view, backgrounds, and ways of experiencing the world. When you have a group of people with many different skill sets, then the team can solve just about any problem but before them, let go of the control. But they all must possess the true desire to understand another person's point of view. Even if they don't agree, I will start to put it this way. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. That is so true. 
How do you detox a red flag of arrogance from your work, from your home, from your church, and from your circle of influence? The answer is quite simple. Build trust. Simon Sinek put it this way, and I quote, a team is not a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other. He said the old guard needed to be able to understand that they can learn from the fresh blood. And the new team members bring a fresh perspective, a new set of weapons on the arsenal. It is important to add people for growth and succession. They bring a fresh perspective that allow the team to continue to be successful. And for their part, the more recent arrivals should learn that sometimes there are good reasons for doing things the way they've always been done. They can look to the elders for wisdom and best practices. Trust is more important than you think for accomplishing goals. When I encounter this toxic element in teams, I require the entire team to look back and to convey and to, to discover trust. Maybe it's time we start rereading the books by Stephen M. R. Covey, Speed of Trust, where Covey explores seven habits of highly successful people. Stephen the Sun notes that trust is a powerful and often overlooked feature, not only for personal relationships, but also for work teams and the company at large. He observed that the lack of trust makes it more difficult to get things done because those involved in the task spend time and energy on distractions, such as wondering how they're being cheated, trying to figure out what their opponents are really up to, and defending their turf rather than doing the task at hand. I've never seen so many people get paid to do absolutely nothing because they've been in the system so long. He calls the cost of this lack of trust a trust tax. It is exacted among members of a team because a company and its customers and clients, and even among family, friends, and others, loved ones in companies, this trust tax is a real cost. The price of inefficiencies and delays. In personal relationship, this cost is happiness and well-being. The opposite of trust tax is a trust dividend, my friend. When members of a team trust each other, all energy and creativity is directed towards the task and the task is done more quickly and efficiently. And the speed of trust is the title of the book. Tasks done by people who trust each other are performed at a greater speed and with less cost and less feuds. The lack of trust can poison team, family, churches. It kills team cohesion, camaraderie and productivity. Convey, go, Convey goes on to describe the interdependence that exists among all the functions of a job, team, or organization. If we can get everyone to see the group from a higher level of operation, the bigger picture, they will learn to see how all the pieces work together. They will see the other players as part of a larger process, not as competitors. You don't have to like me, just respect me. When team members see only as far as their own roles, they don't really understand how their job impacts the other jobs and vice versa. I've never seen anywhere that I've worked where everybody's working against each other, trying to be self-important. This is one way to build trust. We have to learn to look at each other's job and how we fit into the bigger vision and mission of the organization. To be transparent about everyone's role and to emphasize everyone's value to the team. Solution for building a cohesive circle, an important way to do this is to have team Team gathering, family meetings, church gathering that boosts morale, teams and church day away, family time alone that we explore our way time. As we go around the table and the point of intersection and interdependence, as we look at what is, what is going on with our roles and where we feel we are in our groups and our families and our circles. When each person values the other person and their impact on the overarching goals of the team, when they trust each other, the fear and defensiveness that produces arrogance and resistance in the workplace and in our family and churches, will disappear. When arrogance and resistance melt away, cohesion improves, and when cohesion improves, so does productivity. If you're the untrusting person in the scenario, you need to look inward and work on yourself. Change is the only constant, as many thought leaders have repeated over the years, so you'd better get used to it. Change is relevant, my friends. To avoid the, the toxic red flag of arrogance, trust is yourself and in others and your personal circle. If they are not worthy of your trust, then do something about that. Detox your circle, social distance from your circle of untrustworthy people and form a new circle that aligns more closely with your goals and values. If you're not worthy of the trust of others, then earn it back by being more authentic and true to yourself. By being trustworthy, being vulnerable. Nothing is wrong with being vulnerable. I've learned that. There could be, nobody would have been as reserved as I was. I'm still reserved. If you think about it, a certain way, activating your destiny is all about trust. Trust in, in yourself, trusting in God, trusting in others, and that there's still good people around in the world around you. 
trust in God is the most important of all trust. When you trust in God with all your heart and lean up to your own understanding and surrender your will to him, you will see it all fit into play. Heavenly Father, we ask you, God, to take away the arrogance in our hearts because pride goes before a fall. Father, we give you our arrogances and we help us to trust without border and to trust you even when things in our lives are this hell. Even when nothing makes sense and it's a constant, constant gripe and grind. God, we just ask you, Lord, to take charge of our lives and help us to trust in you and to hide your word in our hearts and to detox the arrogance and the self-importance from ourselves and in our lives and circles. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed day. Bless, bless. I hope you were blessed by this morning's word of encouragement.